Welcome to the Mick Dark Horror Series. Lights out. Good. Here we go. The old homestead has been left to the forces of nature for over 50 years. 50 years of wind, rain, and snow. 50 years of gnarled trees and bushes slowly forcing their way into the nooks and crannies between floorboards, walls, and ceilings. 50 years of warping, cracking, and rusting. It stands as a warning to settlers about respecting a land claimed by unnatural forces. A land that cannot be tamed by hard work technology or perseverance, a land that will destroy all those who trespass. It is a place of nightmares. The first people to walk this land knew this to be true. They would give the little patch of gnarled trees and brush a wide berth and avert their eyes. They believed evil spirits would steal their soul if they looked directly at the land. Through sheer luck or supernatural intervention, it remained untouched for thousands of years. That ended when a young farming family decided to homestead on the forbidden land. After that family disappeared, another family, several years later, took up residence on the land. At first, all was peaceful and idyllic, but it quickly ended when the family began hearing strange and unnatural noises, whispers in a deep, jarring voice spoken in a language they didn't understand. The farmer told his family it was the wind and that they were acting like superstitious fools. Then they started seeing things. Just as the sun was setting, they would see the lights in the bushes across from their home. The farmer told his family it was fireflies and nothing more. Then the nightmares began. It started with their son waking up screaming about little people with dog-like faces, trying to drag him into the fields. The nightmares lasted for weeks, but ended suddenly one night, when the farmer's wife went in to check on their son. He was gone. They searched frantically for him and found him standing behind a distant shed, staring, blank-faced, at the fields beyond. When they woke him from his trance, he screamed and pointed into the fields. He never spoke again. For a week, the farmer and his wife tried everything to stop their boy from leaving the home at night. They locked the doors and windows and strung bells across all the entrances. They moved their son into the bedroom and took turns keeping watch over him but they were unable to remain awake and their son always managed to escape after they had fallen asleep. Then one night, he disappeared. The farmer contacted the local police and they searched the area for weeks, but his boy was never found. This devastated the farmer and his wife. They never stopped looking and their endless searching took a toll on their relationship and health. They would catch glimpses of their son, but when they approached... Their heart would sink when they realized it was a trick of the light. To make matters worse, the farmer's wife started having nightmares about little dog-faced people trying to drag her into the field. Within a week, she had also disappeared. Another search ensued and the police began to suspect the farmer. A week after they called off the search for the farmer's wife, the police returned to the homestead to ask the farmer more questions. They found the house in a disastrous state. Paper with cryptic writing was scattered everywhere. All the furniture was gone, and the ceiling in the farmer's bedroom was scorched black. The farmer was nowhere to be found. The family was never seen again, and they were the last people to have lived on the land. Locals tell stories of seeing strange lights and hearing terrifying noises around the old homestead. They give the area a wide berth, and some... Don't look at the unnatural place. Life pulled him hard. It broke all the blocks and locks that bind the dead to earth where they contemplate life as consciousness fades with decomposition. Some last longer than others, 
Few are given a second chance. Wakes rarely wake the dead. His wake was no more or less different or the same as any other wake observed over time immemorial. A body in a corner. Debauchery everywhere else. Hands in passion tore at the peeling cornflower blue wallpaper, patterned with dark blue angels, entwined with pale yellow mortals, wings and limbs covered the naughty bits. Upon closer inspection, it was difficult to determine if the angels were lifting the humans up, dragging them down, or if they were locked in coital embraces. Maybe all, maybe none. Strips of wallpaper slumped into puddles of sick on the floor. He wouldn't have had it any other way. One mourner close to release was the first to notice the wraith. A scream brought other screams as they watched it walk from his body and out the door. It floated more than it walked. They followed in close pursuit. Screams pierced the night as a shadow of the dead walked. One scream cut through all others. It was an old scream announcing new life. He was drawn to it, like a mob to violence. They tried to stop him. How do you stop the dead? Some prayed, some begged, some watched. Nature conspired against them by shrouding his journey in a milk-white mist that swirled and waylaid his pursuers. It was a deadly conspiracy. Mourners stepped into traffic, fell from bridges, or stumbled into the river. Before each death, he chide the coil on for size. No surprise to him, not a one fit. A contract he must fulfill before taking the one he truly wanted. He wouldn't have it any other way. He entered the gal's home with a blast in song. An old song known only to the most recently dead and no others. He walked past the stunned lodgers, locked eyes with a screaming newborn. It stopped. All was silent. The mist swirled about the room, the newborn cooed, and as suddenly as it came, the mist dissipated. He looked at the ring finger of the last remaining mourner and gave her a smile as drool bubbled at the corners of his mouth. He wouldn't have had it any other way. <sighs> Bored. I searched through the storage on my phone to see what I could delete. I removed all those sad attempts at artistic landscapes, my face turning red with embarrassment. There were a series of pictures I took when a suspicious person in a black hoodie changed out of what looked like a hospital pajama bottoms and into a pair of shorts I assumed he stole from the neighboring thrift store. He hid the bottoms under a recycling bin. My apartment is on the fifth floor and overlooks an alley that separates the apartment block I live in from the thrift store. I just happened to be looking out the window while working from home and saw this person behaving very strangely. He was twitchy and erratic. I moved on to the video files expecting to find nothing. I don't usually take videos with my phone. There were three videos, very strange. I clicked the first video and saw a black screen with the audio of what sounded like a commercial. Delete. I clicked on the next file and again a black screen but the audio was of an extremely muffled conversation that ended with a menacing chuckle. The last video was a three-second video of a dark figure crawling through a window. Where the hell were these videos coming from? I deleted all the videos and decided to monitor my storage. A few days later, I checked my phone and there were three videos. All of them were uploaded the day after I cleared my storage, 12.01 a.m., the first video was audio of someone coughing and wheezing. The second was audio of a very hoarse voice saying, I see you. <laughs> Followed by the chilling laugh I heard before. <laughs> the last video was terrifying. 
It was a video of the same suspicious person in a black hoodie taken from my apartment. It showed him doubled over and coughing. Then he slowly turned to look up at my camera and mouthed the words, I see you, followed by him laughing. I never took this video. More disturbing, I realized that I had seen the hooded stranger before. Outside of the thrift shop, there is a notice board in one of the sections is dedicated to clients who have passed away. Rick, the person in the video, had passed away a couple of months ago, long before I took pictures of him in the alley of the recent photos. As I deleted the videos, something moved behind me. It sounded like clothes dropping on the floor. Turning to look, a black figure quickly moved behind the kitchen island, causing me to scream. Who's there? I waited. Nothing moved. I slowly walked around the edge of the island expecting someone to jump out at me. Nothing was there. I took a closer look behind the island and noticed a piece of bright blue cloth stuffed into a cubby hole in the island. I pulled out a pair of bright blue hospital pajama bottoms. started a few weeks ago with some creepy guy peeping on me while I was doing my laundry. There's a storage room door in the laundry room where I live that had always been locked since I moved in a few years ago. I'd never seen it open. Then late one night, I work the late shift so I'm always doing laundry in the early morning hours, I noticed that the door was slightly ajar. I didn't think anything of it and continued to wash my clothes. After loading the dryer, I glanced at the storage room and I thought I saw someone peeping through the sliver of open door. I did a double take and the face was gone. There was something familiar about the face and what I could see of their yellow and orange clothes. I shook my head and I laughed at my paranoia. Later, as I was leaving the laundry room, Smelled like somebody was eating fast food. You know the smell, grease and seared meat. I know it well from my youth working in a shithole fast food restaurant. Smell always brought back shitty memories and makes me sick. I quickly forgot the incident until I was back in the laundry room a few days later, and the storage room was ajar again. I didn't want to feed into my fears, so I avoided locking the door. I went about my business and became engrossed in doing my laundry when I absentmindedly looked at the storage room. I jumped to see the sliver of an eye staring at me. I stared back to make sure I was seeing what I thought I was seeing. The storage room was dark. The sliver of face was lit by the yellow flickering fluorescent lights of the laundry room. Whoever it was was male, over six feet tall and wearing what looked like the uniform from some fast food restaurant that looked vaguely familiar. The smell of fast food was overpowering. I looked away so that he wouldn't think I was challenging him. Yes, I'm a coward. This became the new normal every time I went to the laundry room. I'd asked some of the other tenants if they'd had a similar experience, but they hadn't. They all thought it was creepy and said that they would keep an eye out for anything unusual. It became too much for me so I went to a laundromat down the street to avoid seeing the peeper. Everything was quiet for a couple of days, but then the peeper showed up at the laundromat. He would peep in through a small opening in the door in the back alley, and I would smell the same overpowering smell of fast food. But then he started to whisper to me in the creepiest voice I have ever heard. Sounded like he smoked ten packs a day, drank way too much whiskey, screamed himself hoarse. I couldn't understand a word. I once worked up the courage to ask him to speak louder and he only stared. Then the peepers started showing up in my apartment. 
At first I thought I was just seeing things. I would catch a glimpse of him in almost every room if the door was left slightly open, but when I looked closer, it was a trick of the light. I was becoming paranoid. But all that changed one night when I was half asleep and stumbling my way to the bathroom. I flicked on the hallway light, jumped back when I saw the peeper staring out of a small gap in the bathroom door. I yelled. Get the fuck out of my house or I'm calling the police! He didn't move, but he whispered something unintelligible in his creepy voice. The smell of fast food was sickening. I was fed up and didn't break my stare as I approached the bathroom door. He just stared at me, whispering in garbled whispers. I decided that I was going to kick the door as hard as I could so that it would slam in his stupid face, and I did just that. However, and to my surprise, the door swung open with such a force that the doorknob knocked a doorknob-sized hole in the wall. The bathroom was empty. That's when I realized that the peeper was a ghost. My stomach dropped. Why the fuck was a ghost haunting me? I don't even believe in ghosts. Few days later, I met Maria. I hadn't seen Maria since we worked together at the sleazy fast food joint. We hugged and exchanged the usual pleasantries. Then she asked if I remembered Pete. I fucking hated Pete. He was the biggest piece of shit human being I'd ever met in my life. He was a bully, racist, sexist, borderline klepto, certifiable psychopath or sociopath or some fucking dangerous path. We all worked together in our ridiculous yellow and orange uniforms at Burger Burgomeister, where everyone was a mayor of Burger Town. I also hated that place, but I was young and needed a job. Pete was there to steal anything that wasn't nailed down. What am I talking about? He would steal shit that was wrapped in chains, welded and bolted to the ground. He would take great pleasure in forcing my face inches from the deep fryer, giving me swirlies and shit-stained toilets, and endlessly pinching my nipples and punching me in the groin. So much so that I had to go to emergency for a ruptured testicle. But I wasn't his only victim. We all took turns. Pete would use ethnic slurs instead of given names if you didn't look white to him and he would sexually harass and assault female employees. Management would laugh or turn a blind eye. We were the dregs of society to them. Fight back. Pete was well over six feet and built like a tank. Me, I'm five foot nothing and built like a broom. A new immigrant from Mexico tried to fight back and I never saw so much blood. It was horrible. Fuck, I hated Pete. I ratted Pete out. I don't know if you got the whole picture yet, but Pete liked to steal. Management at Burger Burgomeister wasn't the most observant group of people, so they didn't notice when most items Pete took went missing. However, they did notice when the daily intake didn't balance and then there would be hell to pay. That's when I saw my chance. I hid in the storage room with my video camera. This was long before phones I could take video. Peeped through the door and waited for Pete to be Pete. Didn't take long. I recorded Pete taking a good-sized wad of cash from the till and stuffing it into his back pocket. After seeing the video, management quickly dealt with Pete. A short time later, Pete was arrested on separate charges, but his crime at Burger Burgomeister provided the judge with good reason to increase the severity of Pete's sentence. I remember Pete. I answered sarcastically and thinking to myself, Really? Maria? How could any of us forget? He's dead. I was stunned, but not surprised. How did it happen? I don't know the details, but it happened while he was in prison, about a month ago. Again, not surprised. You must be relieved, Maria said with a smile. I thought to myself, why the hell was she smiling? I hadn't thought about Pete in at least ten years. Why would I be relieved? I answered a little more stern than necessary. I'm sorry, you, you don't know? I mean, nobody told you. Maria looked stunned. No what? A lump started to grow in my throat. Damn, I I'm sorry I'm the one to tell you this, but Pete swore that he was going to get even with you for ratting him out. Fuck. I said as I searched my emotions, and without thinking, I answered. 
I'm glad he's dead. There was a long pause as we looked everywhere but at each other. Then it dawned on me. It fucking dawned on me. That rat bastard Pete had come back from the grave to haunt me. Fuck, I hate Pete. The hard white light was followed by a noise that pulled the air from their lungs. The horizon in the west glowed orange. Several were missing. They turned to those who knew about such things, but their answers were cryptic. A few brave ones set out towards the glow. The glow intensified throughout the night. In the dim morning light, they could see smoke and dust on the horizon to the west. It formed a wall of grotesque twisting shapes that slowly changed color from orange to pale yellow and clawed at the sky. Below the wall, they could see dark shapes moving. This was familiar, and they knew that they had to run once the ground started to shake. They ran for the river. The sky turned black with birds. The thumping of their wings sounded like the racing heart of a pursued animal. They were quickly followed by hares, foxes, deers, and coyotes. Predator and prey running side by side as they darted through the tall grass. Then came the bison. Their massive dark forms rocking back and forth in their stiff gallop. As they trampled slower moving species into the churned earth... Some animals headed towards the river and tried to cross it, but they were quickly swept away by the current. Others ran along the bank. The humans knew the best crossing points, but some had not been able to outrun the bison. Their small band had suffered losses. They crossed the river and waited and watched. At night, the glow hung low over the land and billowed and moved like smoke. During the day, the glow would fade but the earth continued to scorch as the invisible force moved over the land. The prairie grasses, shrubs, and bushes blackened and crumbled, and the earth baked and cracked under a pulpy paper sky. It did not cross the river. They followed the glow and scorched earth from across the river for four days and nights. On the fifth day, they found the edge where the living met the dead. They crossed the river and followed the edge. The glow was no longer visible at night. They did not cross the line. Neither did the animals. Some wanted to enter the dead land to search for the brave ones and those who went missing the night of the great light and sound. Others considered them dead, believed those who entered the dead land would also die. They pointed to the animals of the land and the sky who did not cross the invisible barrier. It was foolish to cross the line. There was much anger and sadness on the sixth day. As the sixth night approached... Darkness slowly crept across the dull gray sky, mixed with cracks of light that broke through the ragged edges on the horizon, turned the sky into a boiling mass of gray and orange. The ones who knew of such things called it a bad omen. They listened to the warnings and moved away from the edge of the dead land for the night. The dead land twinkled with lights. They stood in silence watching the lights. The intense white lights danced and spun like sparks from a fire against the black abyss. The lights whispered to the watchers. Those who stepped forward and crossed the line were quickly enveloped by the abyss. As twilight turned to a crisping, clear morning, a solitary figure sat cross-legged at the dead land's edge. His eyes were wide open, his breathing deep and rhythmic. In the distance, a copse of blackened and gnarled trees topped a small hill. A large black mass seemed to boil up from the ground and then charge down the hill towards the cross-legged figure. Again, the ground shook, but the figure did not move. He changed his gaze to look directly at the monstrous shape charging towards him. His face showed no emotion. The shape grunted and growled as it descended the hill, its shape shifting as it moved. At the dead land's edge, it stopped and stared deep into the eyes of the figure. The large bear huffed and growled. The figure stared deep into the eyes of the bear, his breathing rhythmic. His body unmoving. The bear reared to its full height and roared, but the figure did not break his gaze. 
The bear sat on its haunches, and the two figures sat motionless, staring at each other. Day turned to night. The lights from the night before twinkled in the bear's eyes. The figure did not move. In the pre-dawn darkness, the bear moved forward to cross the line and quietly blew into fragments of black smoke that swirled up into the brightening sky. The figure did not move. When the sun had reached its zenith, the figure stood, closed his eyes, placed his hands together as if in prayer, and bowed towards the hill. He opened his eyes and lights twinkled in the black abyss of his eyes. Before turning to leave, he made a symbol in the air that momentarily lingered as pale green light. The small group of travelers didn't look at the cops of gnarled black trees at the top of the wind-scoured hill. They trudged, bent forward, against the gustling autumn wind. The golden late day sun lit the rose hips on fire, turned the waves of undulating wild grasses bronze. The sun was a brief respite from the snow flurries that melted on contact with the ground, still engorged with the summer's warmth. The travelers' hats were pulled low, their scarves wrapped high, so only their eyes showed. The eyes of travelers, eyes incised by the lives of ancestors who lived and died on this land for generations, Eyes that saw more death than life since the arrival of the settlers. Eyes the settlers avoided. The farmer watched the travelers cross his land. He gripped his old military rifle a little tighter and waited to see if they changed direction towards his home. He closed his eyes and whispered, Don't change direction. Don't change direction. Don't change direction. Images of bullet-riddled bodies of travelers flashed through his mind. He loosened his grip and let the rifle fall to his side. He opened his eyes. The travelers did not change direction. They didn't even look towards the hill with the cops of black and gnarled trees at the top. It was a gross misunderstanding. The horses were missing. The travelers had the horses. They had to be taught a lesson. The farmer joined the mob and pulled the trigger like the rest. Stacked the bodies like the rest watched them burn like the rest and buried the remains like the rest. Didn't matter that the fence was broken, that the travelers didn't have a history of horse theft, that the accuser had a long history of violence against the travelers. It wasn't a misunderstanding. It was bloody murder. The farmer's wife was a traveler. Wife. He always felt uncomfortable referring to her in that way. The word implied ownership, and he knew he owned his wife about as much as he owned the stars in the sky. When she turned those eyes towards him, he would feel a single heavy throb in his chest in fear that she knew his horrible secret. It terrified him. She watched the farmer from the kitchen window. Their child was behind her in fits of laughter as he built a tower out of blocks and then sent it crashing to the ground. She couldn't see her people, but she knew they were there. They knew she was there. To clear her mind, she closed her eyes and listened to all the different sounds of the wind as it blew through the house and the trees and the bushes outside. Then she flinched. There was something else in the wind. She focused her mind and began to search methodically for the source of the sound. Her eyes shot open. Voices. Her senses heightened. She jumped and spun around the sound of the blocks crashing behind her. The boy did not laugh. As the travelers receded into the distance, appearing to merge with the landscape, the farmer slung his rifle across his back and picking up the post hole digger. He was building a fence around next year's vegetable garden. He held the handles together and thrust the shovel into the ground while steam rose from his sweat-drenched shirt during lulls in the wind. The ground didn't give. He lifted the shovel higher, put some weight behind it, and drove it into the ground again, again, and again. He slowly worked the shovel deep enough to scoop out some earth. He pulled up the shovel, dropped the earth off to the side. In the fading light, he saw something white. He picked up the object and wiped away the matted earth, sticks, and roots. It was a bone. Human bone. The farmer looked up and around in a panic. The sky darkened. 
and the snow fell in heavy wet flakes that flattened the grass, collected in the coolies, as the increasing cold won out the summer's warmth. The boy was gone. She wasn't one to panic, so she methodically thought through the series of events, then searched the house calling his name. She couldn't get the voices out of her head. The screams didn't make sense. She returned to the kitchen and faced the living room where a large window overlooked a small field with a thick patch of burr oaks at the far end. The fading light and heavy snowfall seated the room with gray shadows that grew as the storm thickened and the sun set. She was quickly in darkness. As she turned to light the lantern, she paused when she saw movement in the corner of the room. She breathed a sigh of relief and called to the boy. Silence. The heavy flakes splashed against the living room window in wet thumps. She called the boy again. The wet snow thumped against the window. She turned and lit the lantern. The room was empty. She walked over to the Chesterfield, knelt on the cushions. She cupped her hands against the window to see outside. The wet snow on the window warped the wintry landscape beyond into Dali-esque distortions. She thought it's what the world might look like inside someone else's dream or nightmare. She saw her husband in the distance. He was surrounded by dark, shadowy figures that seemed to shimmer and contort with changes in the storm. She ran to the door called out to him. Hearing his wife's call, the farmer rushed towards the house. There was something in her voice. He couldn't clearly hear what she was saying over his heavy breathing and the loud creak and crunch of his footfalls as he fumbled his way through the snow. He thought he heard something about their boy and strangers. As he neared the house, he thought he heard the boy's laugh. He stopped and listened. The snow sounded like the soft metallic click of a giant precision timepiece keeping perpetual time. Mounds of snow formed where stiff stalks of grass were unwilling to bend under the weight. It was a losing battle. Looking down to take a step, he thought he heard the laugh again. He quickly looked up, saw the light go out in his house, and then a scream. He ran. The farmer's wife went to the closet next to the outside door, put on her oilskin duster. As she turned back towards the room, she jumped and screamed as a light went out. In the corner of the room was a black mass, the size of a man, shimmering and contorting in the murky light cast by the snow outside. She stared at the black mass in disbelief, seemed to stare back. After what felt like an eternity, the black mass spoke to her. The snow thumped against the window. The farmer stopped running. He saw his little boy run into the burr oaks just west of the house, wearing nothing but a light shirt and overalls. The farmer was stunned. He called to the boy. No answer. The snow kept time. He called to his wife. No answer. He looked from the house to the oaks a couple of times and decided to chase after his boy, he would quickly die in this weather. The burr oaks fought his progress at every turn. The black branches ripped and tore at his clothes. The roots caused him to stumble and fall at almost every step. The farmer stopped in the gnarled oaks to listen for his son. The black patchwork of branches provided glimpses of the dingy glow of snow beyond. He couldn't hear anything over his heavy breathing, so he held his breath and listened for his boy. A spark quickly flared and faded a few paces in front of him. He thought he was seeing things. He called to his boy. Another spark flared and faded just beyond the oaks. A dark mass blocked out the meager light that penetrated the heavy weave of branches in front of him. Pain shot through his body, and he dropped to the ground. It felt as though his chest and arms had been pierced by hot lead. Fighting the pain, he struggled to his feet and using the burr oaks as support, fought his way through the twisted mass of branches to the field beyond where, exhausted, he dropped to his knees and then fell face first into the snow. The farmer wasn't sure how long he had lain in the snow. He was shivering uncontrollably. He managed to push himself up to all fours and then feebly fell back into a sitting position. From behind, he heard his wife ask, How could you? How could you? 
He hung his head and began to cry. She walked from behind and stood in front of him, so she could see his face. She wore her oilskin duster and held the hand of their boy, who wore wool cap mittens, large rubber boots, and a duster tailored to his size. He stared at his father with a confused look on his face. Is, is this where you did it? You and your mob? He fought his near convulsive shivering to answer, but only broken sounds came out. Black masses started to form around his wife and son, their shapes solidified. He knew them all too well. The small group of travelers didn't look at the cops of gnarled black trees at the top of the wind-scoured hill as they trudged through the snow. The gold and late-day sun lit the rose hips on fire that stood sentinel above the thick blankets of snow. The sun was a brief respite from the flurries that had fallen all day. The travelers stopped by a mound in the snow and then continued on their way. <laughs>